Hello, peace be with you all. Uh, my name is Shaivat Sakanan. So I want to share with you some of my thoughts about peace and conflict. If you can see uh, on the, your screen, it will say when conflict whispers. Now, what about peace? In my view, peace is about how to engage conflict constructively and to prevent conflict from sliding into violence. There are two parts in this that I want to underscore. The first point is that um, conflict is something natural. When you say, you know, this is a conflict free society, it doesn't lie in my book because we have different levels of conflict that we can talk about, which we will uh, eventually. Peace is how you engage conflict constructively and to prevent conflict from sliding into violence, which, which means conflict and violence are two different things from two different worlds. And so, our job as a peace workers is how to engage conflict in such a way that it would not turn into violence. So that's, that's what peace is about. In order to do so, one has to understand conflict profoundly and understand conflict. I wanted to talk about conflict in general, which with some emphasis on transformation. I use six words as a guide in this talk. The first is tragedy. Second is thinking about conflict. Uh, the third is words. Fourth is theory, fifth is profit, and the last one is whisper. Let's begin with tragedy, and that I mean real tragedy. I'm, I'm talking about the ultimate Greek tragedy of uh, Sophocles, Antigone. Antigone is a tragic uh, story about a young girl, of course, in ancient Greek, whose uh, uncle Creon was the despot. Uh, the word despot doesn't mean even dictatorship. It doesn't mean bad or anything like that. So it's a power that is controlling the city. Uh, there's a war, a family war in a way. Antigone has two brothers. One is on one side of the war. The other one is on the other side of the war. In the end, both of them fought in the war and died in the process of fighting. Now, when uh, they died, uh, it is customary in, in ancient Greek that the honorable needs to be buried the despicable needs to be left to be food of the vultures. So the problem with the situation there is that Antigone, is, since she is the sister of these uh, two guys, Antiochus and Polynesus, she has a, a dilemma between to bury her, her brother or to obey the law. Now, her, her uncle Creon passed the law say that is, if anyone bury what her uh, uncle had done is this, then he kick a body and then uh, honor the dead in ceremonial dead and bury and left the other uh, unto the elements. For Antigone, this is conduct unbecoming. She cannot live with that because she said, this is her brothers. As a result of the fighting, you cannot tell who is who. The dead bodies were torn apart by so many things. She said, uh, what she would do is, is between to bury or to obey the law. Now, there are two versions, at least two versions of Antigone. One is, of course, the, the classic by Sophocles, Antigone, and the other one is Jean Anouilly, Antigone. That's in the 20th century uh, French writer who rewrote Antigone at the advent of the Nazi attack on France. And so it was seen as a woman's voice against dictatorship or something like that, if you read uh, Antigone that way. In Thai, one of the leading drama professors produced a play and she translated the word as Antra Kani, which is such a nice rendition in Thai because Antra, Antra means in between and Akani means fire. So in between the fire. And so that's precisely captured the, the situation, but the interpretation caused a lot of, of, of problems. Even, you know, wherever you go, if, if you use uh, Jean Anouilly uh, Antigone, then it is this a celebration of a brave uh, one against despotic and try to maintain uh, the rights uh, and freedom. And for Antigone, again, when it came out in, in Thailand after democratic revolution of 2016, uh, what happened then was a lot of, of debate about the story. I, wanted, I don't want to go there. But why I use Antigone? Because uh, if you read Hegel lectures in the philosophy of religion, Hegel said the collision between the two highest moral powers is enacted in that absolute example of tragedy that is Antigone. And this is Hegel vouched for, for this story. Now, if we go deep into the story a little bit, then I wanted to use it as a paradigmatic story about conflict. 
and conflict and its role in politics. What you see there is a contestation of ultimate source of authority. And in antiquity, you have different levels of conflict. You have the household and the city. In Greek, it's of course, and police. Police, of course, is, is uh, politics. And if you read politics of Aristotle, the first few chapters into book one, Aristotle talk about of course, household. And then conflict between men and women, conflict between nature and convention. Nature is uh, family ties. Convention is rule of the city. Uh, human reason, logos, and sacred obligation, ancestral piety, or the, the contrast between Jerusalem and Athens that uh, we don't have time for that. I see that as a contestation between two paradigms of thinking that governs the world even today. Uh, a paradigm of faith, that is Jerusalem, and a paradigm of reason or philosophy, that is Athens. Here, I want you to see Creon in a new light. Creon is voice of the public legal authority as the city's police voice. Welfare of the city is the highest ethical obligation for Creon. And so for Creon, the quality of the good is inseparable from one's value to the city. It is therefore impossible to bury the strata. Remember the story, two brothers, you know, leading two, two armies fighting against each other. Both of them die. Nobody can tell which bodies belong to which brother. But if you bury the traitor, that is to honor him, that would mean there's no difference between the good and the bad. And if there is no difference between the good and the bad, it will destroy the quality of the good that is the part of human value to the city. Uh, so police is about the city. Uh, I'm not talking about police, uh, the force that got the law and things like that. I'm talking about police meaning the political society in Greek. For Antigone, that's Creon, her uncle, who's the, the despot, the, the ruler of, of the city. Uh, Antigone police position is pre-political position, one would argue. The police as a theological political institution where the state is a religious community. Uh, this is interesting. You can ask yourself whether uh, it uh, resonates with, with today's society, to what degree does it resonate or not resonate to uh, today's society. Uh, individual liberty is unknown. Man was enslaved to the state through his soul, his body, and his property. Uh, that is the, the condition of the ancient city, Greek ancient city in, in particular. Now, Antigone's world is not the public sphere of reason, but a private world of nature and mystery. Two different things. Antigone takes the fact of blood and kinship to be more fundamental because they are natural and therefore they are natural law whereas for for the city is is the rule of the city is the law of the city that is the the natural law now antigone believes that the family can exist without the city but the city cannot exist without the family now this is very important because uh, those of us who are interested in rights and liberty it is wise to to uh, think of the work of uh, uh, Michael Ignatius. Uh, Antigone believes that the family can exist without the without the city, but the city cannot exist without the family. And this is the contestation be between, uh, you know, the world of rights and liberty, as as uh, universalists are talking about, and what Michael Ignatius called ordinary virtues, which is you know all over the world at the moment. Hegel said here, familial love, the holy, the inward, belonging to inner feeling, the law of the gods collides with the right of the state. Creon is not in the wrong. Each of these two sides actualize only one of the ethical powers. Those of you who are in philosophy knows that uh, the word actualization is very Hegelian. Yeah? Um, the meaning of et eternal justice is made manifest first. Both attain injustice before they, they are one-sided, but both also attain justice. So which in each side you have injustice and justice at the same time. And this is why Hegel say genuine tragedies in the world are not conflicts between the right and the wrong. You know, if the world is between the right and the wrong and for us to choose is easy. But if it's, it is the conflict between two rights that makes it very difficult. And that's what uh, it means by, uh, by tragedy. I just put on uh, a few slides here. Okay, I go very quickly. Now, how to think about conflict. We go, we go from tragedy to think, uh, thinking, yeah? Uh, we can think about conflict in different ways. Uh, conflict as a social phenomenon, 
a, a general description yeah? conflict as a system if you if you listen to people who say conflict is a system my question is what kind of a system are you talking about you're talking about mechanistic system or organic system both are very different uh, a watch a watch is a mechanistic mechanistic system a hand is an organistic system both are system you know but very different conflict as commodity political economy of conflict yeah whenever you have conflict uh, people can profit or loss as a result of that conflict so this is is a, is a commodity uh, that's why people can can buy and sell conflict and make make uh, make a living out of conflict in some cases uh, conflict as a living organism so when you think of conflict as a living organism i'm, I'm, I'm inclined towards that approach if you can talk about evolutions of conflict you can talk about birth of conflict you can talk about con sickness of conflict you can talk about death of conflict you can talk about when conflict is reborn it's a fascinating vision of a conflict that you can, you can think about and then conflict as practices and people will come and train you about techniques of conflict organization experts evaluation steps and what have you now words there's so many words uh, that can be used about conflict in your language i know you come from all uh, societies in southeast asia and you have different uh, words for, for for conflict if you do not use the, the english word you know but in the english word you have several uh, words that em embody conflict in itself frustration frustration is one person one in unrealized goal and we have conflict i am a muslim i am a person uh, suppose i had not fasted during the, the ramadan the ramadan just passed and i did not fast so maybe because i was sick or whatnot uh, uh, so I was very frustrated. The truth is, I, I did. I fasted and continue to fast uh, the additional six days today. Uh, this is the, the second day. Uh, dilemma. Dilemma is one person, two inco incompatible goals. You know, I have two, two things in my life that I want to do. I, I wanted to read uh, my academic, academic work. Or I want to play, for example. When I was younger, maybe I have two wonderful uh, women in my heart, and I I have to choose between the two. You know, that's a dilemma. Uh, a career. You wanted to be a career. Someone wanted to be a politician. Someone wanted to be an uh, academician. You know, the, the dilemma. Dispute. Two persons, one scarce goal. People sometimes uh, misunderstood that conflict is about people who want different things. A lot of time we find people who want the same thing and that's why you have a conflict and a lot of people call it uh, a dispute uh, so two person one scarce call and where, that, that's where you talk about uh, conflict uh, you know no, dispute resolution uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution settling thing in court uh, court decides between uh, two, two persons or two groups of people and one goal i'm staying in this part of land uh, I want this part of land, but the government said this part of land is is uh, national parks, so I cannot be there. So one scarce goal, two group of people dispute. Contradiction, incompatible goal states in a goal seeking system. The case of Antigone is something like that, you know, because uh, the police has its own uh, goal seeking system, and of course uh, the household, the family has its own uh, goal seeking system. So that we call that contradiction. And in our, in our world, contradiction is very important. Uh, it's one of the most, uh, I think, fascinating aspects. Now, if you think of the father of modern peace research, Johan Galtung, who's also my teacher, he has a conflict theory, which, which he made it into a very simple thing. He said, there are a triadic construct of ABC. For him, A is attitudes. But by attitudes, he means assumption and bias. That's, that's for him, attitude. He knows, of course, you know, all these terms are, are different, but he likes the, the acronym ABC, it's easy to understand. And, and so uh, attitudes, assumption, and bias is A. Then behavior, then content of the conflict, contradictional content. That's why contradiction is important. Uh, that's Galtung. This is Chaiwat. My understanding of ABC of conflict, I transform it is a little bit. As you can see, I rearrange it you know i put behavior at the top and then you have contradiction in the middle and then you have attitudes uh, at the 
deepest layer. So what I would say is that behavior is the layer of conflict where you can easily see. So it's manifested conflict behavior. And the manifestation of conflict is not shown. It doesn't mean conflict is not there because sometimes it's latent conflict. Here you have attitudes. Latent conflict is different because you know sometimes you don't like some people, you don't speak out. Uh, you disagree with him, you disagree with the policy, but you don't speak out. So it, the Latin conflict is right there. What you see there is that you see behavior, which is a visible type of conflict, uh, because it is manifested conflict. That, uh, you, you do not see first, uh, attitude, but it's there, you know, it's internalized conflict, whereas behavior is externalized conflict. I put it in layers. What about contradiction? Contradiction to me is very important. Contradiction is about issues. Contradictions is what I use in my understanding of how to say when conflict is difficult or not difficult. Sometimes when conflict is not difficult to solve, you know, uh, it's because contradiction is shallow. When contradiction is very uh, deep, conflict will be difficult to solve. Example, two parties, one a piece of land. Uh, if the problem is about the price of land, two group of people are talking the same thing, same language. The, the difference is the occupants say that they want a higher price, uh, and the, the buyer or the one who wants the, the land say that they want a lower price. So the issue is about negotiation of the price of the land. If they can reach the compromise point, then they will agree that, okay, we will sell the land. The other will be happy to buy the land at certain price. That's easy. What is difficult? When conflict is deep. When the land is not a commodity, it's more than that. When the land is my, my inheritance, this land belonged to my ancestors. And by ancestors, I mean 200 years uh, of this land. This land is also has a religious significance. Look, uh, you will see the, the graveyards of my ancestor, my family who were buried here, you know, generations after generation. And look, this land was given to us because we fought in the, you know, 200 years ago, there's a war between us and the other, the other society, and we fought to maintain this land. And the land was given to us by the king. Uh, and so it was worth an honor. It was a, a mark of membership to the political society. It was a sacred place. It was my ancestral land. All this makes it very difficult because the contradiction is deep. And so it's not about the price of land anymore. It's something else. Now conflict transformation. Conflict transformation begins by assuming that there is nothing sacred about the status quo. And this is important. Status quo could be the source and a source of conflict itself. A dictatorial regime, the type of constitutional regime that we have might be a source of the conflict itself. But if you say, is this, is this sacred? Then we cannot do anything about it, okay? Conflicts are due to contradiction in the structure of society. This is conflict transformation. Therefore, conflict needs to be moved from unbalanced, that is asymmetric power relations, to a more balanced, that is symmetric power relations. So it, it's all about power. It's not only about conflict, it's all about power. From asymmetric power relations to a balance, a more balanced or symmetric uh, power relations. That is what conflict transformation is about. And it began in a uh, long time ago, but in 1970s, uh, conflict are linked to deeper structure in society, both national and international. That's the work of uh, Dieter Senghorst on conflict transform, on conflict formation, and, and Krippendorf on uh, a, a peace research and industrial revolution that talks about this. And then Adam Kerr in 1971 talks about restructure re relationships so that conflict or alienation that had made it unpeaceful is eliminated and replaced by a collaboration that prevents it from recurring. That's, uh, you know, saying us and, and Curl and others. Now, ways of transformation. When you talk about transformation, what are you talking about? Transform what? Four things. Actor transformation, interchange between parties, you know, change the, uh, change the, the, the prime minister actor transformation, issue transformation, alteration of agenda, modification of what? conflict is about. This is not about uh, the, who is the prime minister, who is not a prime minister. This is about 
authoritarianism in Thai society. Uh, that's issue. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, rule transformation is affecting all the parties. That is the law or the real the rule. And then a structural transformation. We are talking about applying to inter-party relations. So, so there are different type of transformation that one can talk about. You know, as you can see, and you can see the ease and the difficulty uh, at each level, uh, which is very different. Then, what is conflict transformation? I say conflict transformation transformation is about moving conflict with an emphasis on transformation. It means conflict can be moved, so you're moving conflict, uh, and then you're finding the best option for all, and then you take conflict parties outside of the present reality in order to do that. First, you have to understand that conflict can be moved. Second, your purpose is to find the best option for all. In order to do so, you take conflict parties outside of the present reality, which chain them and they cannot move out. Conflict transformation has, has three elements in it. Creativity, nonviolence, and empathy. When I, when I say that one has to move out of real life, it's creativity that we have to do that. In order to make it possible for, for one to, to be creative, one has to move out of the chain reality that we are in. You know, nonviolence, uh, I'm, I'm sure you will have uh, a chance to go to the notion of nonviolence later. And empathy, very important. You know, empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is it's not the, the English phrase of uh, putting oneself into one's shoes. I like the Thai phrase better. That is uh, putting the heart of the other into ours import the heart of the other into ours. It means taking our heart out, then putting the heart of the other into ours, and then see the world from that position, which is very important. That's what empathy means. I give you an example of the uh, Prophet Muhammad as a solution to the Kaaba conflict, because uh, you are from Southeast Asia, and there's a lot of you might come from Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, some uh, even the Philippines, or some of you might be Muslim or not. And I can do this in Buddhist uh, and, and Christian, but I, time doesn't permit me. So with your permission, I will uh, use this uh, case of Prophet Muhammad's solution to the Kaaba conflict. The story is like this. When Muhammad was uh, 35, uh, uh, there was a flood. The Kaaba was not like that at that time. It was like this, you know, the picture here. And there was a flood. After the flood, all the tribes came in and want to rebuild, the, repair the, the Kaaba. They finished repairing the Kaaba. The final task is to put this black stone into the, its proper place. And in Arab culture, not Muslim, in the Arab culture at that time, because at that time Islam was not born. The prophet was born, but he was 35. The prophet be, began to receive the God's revelation when he was uh, 40. So this is before Islam, so to speak. Anyone who can put this, uh, this, is, this black stone into its place is highly honorable. So they started to fight the, 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 the 10 uh, group of people, the tribes people came in. So finally they said, let's wait, see who to the gate. And then we let him uh, decide for us. The prophet came in, he listened to this. Uh, what he did is that he refused to make a decision. What he did was that he said, he, he take off his cloak he put it on the on the ground, and then he, he put the black stone on top of the cloak and uh, asked all the attentive uh, to take a cloak, his cloak, so everyone could participate at the same time. And then we walked to the, the place and put the black stone into it. This is what conflict transformation is about. To imagine a new reality, you become creative, you are nonviolent, you avoid, uh, you prevent people from using violence against each other because if, if you decide, you know, this one, if it's to Chief A, what about Chief B, C, D, E, F? Conflict might not be there, but it will be Latin. So the, con the prophet did that. And that is what I call, uh, you know, a, a, a paradigmatic uh, example of uh, conflict transformation. Now the whisper. When conflict whispers, imagine conflict as a person. If the person conflict whispers, his or her secret in your ears. What would be that secret message in one sentence? You can exercise on your own, uh, but I will give you my, my answer. My answer is this. My conflict whispers. Conflict whispers into my ears like this. I am your treasure. Don't prevent me. Hide me in shame or destroy me with violence and hatred, but find better ways to engage me. You and your society 
when will become stronger and become more peaceful. That was that. Sorry, I take a little bit too much of your time. I hope you will hear your own conflict whispers in your ears and make sense of what it means. Thank you. And peace be with you all.